Okay, so I think we'll just make a start. People will still be joining in. Um, so welcome to today's webinar. Thank you for joining us. And as we said um, earlier, but for folks who have just joined, there is interactive parts. So please scan the QR code um, and Sherry's going to copy that into the chat. Um, please, can you turn off? Well, I think the cameras are off and the microphones. The chat function is there, which if you've got any questions at the end and we've got any time, we will be able to answer any questions. And if there's any questions we've not had time to answer, we will certainly put that out in one of our emails. So thanks again for joining us today. So the webinar will last for about an hour. It will be recorded and it will be available on the Care Inspectorate website in due course. So this is one of a series of webinars and we have tried not to make things too repetitive. Um, and if you wanted to find out something in more detail on one of the topics, please look at the content of the others. We've got three others that are going to be produced um, or email us and we can signpost you to that. Okay. So today's webinar is titled Supporting Positive Peer Relationships for People Who Live in Care Homes. Quite a mouthful. By peer relationships, we mean friendships and friendly, friendly relationships between people experiencing care. During the webinar, we aim to briefly cover what research tells us about peer relationships in care homes and also what people have told us during some recent visits we've made to care homes. We will discuss some strategies for supporting peer relationships and some of the um, things to consider, including personal planning. Our focus is on care homes for adults and older people, but we are sure much of this content is relevant to other settings where people experiencing care spend time together. There will also be a chance to share your own thoughts and ideas. Uh, much of what we will share is not new, but is a helpful reminder of the simple things that can make a big difference. OK, so the Anne's Law project. So Anne's Law is a planned piece of Scottish legislation intended to strengthen the rights of people living in adult and older people's care homes to see and spend time with those that are important to them. It has arisen from campaigning by family members who were separated from their loved ones during the pandemic. Um, as it is still going through the process to become legislation, we have got two new health and social care standards which are in place, which support people's right to see and spend time with their loved ones and to participate in their care if this is what people want in the event of an infectious disease outbreak. The Care Inspector has seconded two inspectors, myself and Sherry. We didn't introduce ourselves at the beginning. So I'm Barbara Lawson. I've got my colleague here, Sherry Kerr. And we're also supported by Louise Kelly from the Growing a Good Life team. So we're delighted to have Louise with us today. So our project is funded by Scottish Government and we've been got funding for a year. So as well as supporting the sector to prepare for this legislation, the project exists to promote the vital importance of all types of meaningful connection for people who live in care homes. We don't just want to get people into care homes to visit, but we want the visits and all connections to really mean something. Great. Hi, everybody. Yeah, so um, as Barbara just said, I'm Sherry and I'm one of the other people working on the project. Well, I'm actually the only other person working on the project. So <laughs> glad to see everyone here today. Um, so we keep talking about meaningful connection, but what do we actually mean by it? It's about all those connections that are important to people and that bring value and meaning to life. So that can be the connections that we have with our families and friends, with our peers, with staff in a care home or another service, and with the wider community. Meaningful connection is not only about engaging socially with other people or having a visitor, although those things are really important. It can also include being present in your own surroundings with 
things that matter to you, being able to connect with the outdoors, for instance, or read a book, or listen to your favorite music, or write to a poorly friends. So if we think about what makes connection between people meaningful, as Barbara just said, it's not necessarily just about being able to see each other. And I think we saw this during the pandemic when even when people were allowed to visit each other again, it was very restricted. The visit had to occur in a certain place. People had to stay six feet apart or on the other side of a window or a screen wear PPE and so on. And for a lot of people, that wasn't a very meaningful experience for them, particularly when people had cognitive or sensory impairments. Or, for instance, if someone is sitting in a lounge in a care home with their family member or friend and they can't connect very well because the TV's blaring and it's noisy and that maybe creates anxiety for them. So meaningful connection can be about ensuring that we create a culture and an environment that really supports connection, where people's experiences and relationships are enhanced and where they're really enabled to get the best out of life. OK, so that's what we mean by meaningful connection. But why is it so important? At the start of the project, we carried out a review of published research on connection, specifically related to people who live in care homes. And that kind of served to confirm what we probably all instinctively already know, that meaningful connection is integral to promoting health and well-being, and it is a fundamental human right. It allows people to feel valued as individuals. It enhances personhood. And just briefly to say what we mean by personhood, it's what's been defined by Tom Kitwood, who I'm sure some people will have heard of as a standing or status that is bestowed upon one human being by another in the context of relationship and social being. It implies respect, recognition and trust and valuing people as the unique individuals that they are. There's a large body of research to tell us that a lack of meaningful connection has profoundly negative consequences for people's emotional, mental and their physical well-being. For instance, loneliness and social isolation will tend to have a negative impact on people's nutritional intake. And overall, lack of connection is also linked to higher mortality rates. However, research has consistently found that there are high levels of loneliness and social isolation among people who live in care homes, particularly, although not exclusively, older people. The same applies to many older people in the community, but it is particularly prevalent in care homes. Uh, although there may be lots of people around people, that doesn't necessarily mean that people are feeling that sense of connection, which we want them to feel and that is so important. So for a lot of people, meaningful connection clearly isn't necessarily happening in the way that we'd all like it to be. So that's kind of very, very brief overview of the research. But if anyone's interested in learning more about that, um, the literature review, which we've just published, is available on the Care Inspectorate website. And we'll also put a link to that in the webinar chat at the end. OK, great. Thank you, Sherry. So we're moving on to the interactive part, one of the interactive parts of the webinar. So it's we want to create a word cloud. Um, I think these are very effective in just bringing, you know, feelings and thoughts together. So if you can use the um, QR code and join in, we'd love to um, have your views. So one or two words. So what words or feelings comes to mind and Louise is going to come in and share um, some of these with us. So thank you. Great seeing some um, come now. Perfect. This is lovely. It's lovely to see these words coming in. And if you're not sure how, how to do that, have a look at the chat where the QR code is. Um, and if you scan, point your, your camera at the QR code, it'll bring you up to this slide and you can pop your thoughts in. Do you know, there's, there's a lovely range of things here, Barbara and Sherry, like laughter is coming up in the middle, uh, which means more, more people have, have said that laughter, happiness, kindness, trust, um, support. And then there's, there's these lovely feelings of safety, reassurance and comfort. And then the fun things like cocktails and uh, 
a chat and emotional hug. So friendship is so, you know, the, the huge variety of words here that that connect with the joy and the support and the laughter and the companionship that friendship brings brings to us all. Yeah, brilliant. And that's over 162 contributions. So thanks, everyone. That's brilliant. OK, thank you. So you can keep typing away, but we'll move on to the next slide. OK. So the research um, review, the literature review emphasised the value of positive peer relationships for people who live in care homes. Research found that moving into a care home could give opportunities to develop friendships that enrich people's daily lives and enhance their sense of identity and personhood. Friendships supported people to have a sense of purpose and belonging, helping them to feel more at home in their environment and feel part of the care home community. Research found that friendships were facilitated by common interests and life experiences, as well as just having the opportunity to be around each other and spend time together. However, although the research indicated positive peer relationships were so beneficial for people, in practice, researchers found that not many people had described having close relationships with peers. This was particularly in care homes for older people. Some of the quotes from the research were, I have no friends here. I've got no one to talk to. I'm so lost here. It's just not me. It's not home. It's so big. People said they wanted more opportunities to socialise within the home and develop friendships. Some felt that if they did find commonalities and make friendships, it was only by coincidence that this happened. And as, as already mentioned, many people experienced loneliness and isolation. Some people felt other residents' behaviour was hard to deal with and felt they had little in common with others who were at different physical cognitive or age levels and I know in some care homes that we've visited you can have people living in their 50s with um, age-related conditions but also people right up into their hundreds so you've got sometimes five decades of people um, living in the one home. As part of the Anne's Law project we really wanted to hear what people were saying in Scotland and especially from people experiencing care. Most of the research articles had been from the family carers perspective, which was understandable due to the reduced footfall in services over the pandemic, making research more difficult to carry out. So over the last few months, we've visited 20 care homes across Scotland to not only hear the voices of people experiencing care, but also from their families and friends and staff. We wanted to find out what's important to people about connections and hear about their experiences and why this mattered. Overall, we spoke to 277 people using a semi-structured interview and with the greatest proportion of these being people experiencing care, which was 38% of the total number of people we spoke to, which we were absolutely delighted about. And as you can see, here's some highlights, uh, well, just some um, quotes that we've picked out um, and we've got them here um, we've got I went down to the lounge and I didn't like it I tried to talk to her but with a lot of noise it's not easy I don't want to be rude but I haven't got anyone to have a conversation with most of the time if you speak to them you talk to them and that sort of thing but two minutes later they don't know what you've asked some questions about the same things we just got introduced. She comes through from the other side. She said, I'll take you around a bit and show you what it's like here. And that was it. I couldn't do without her now and she couldn't do without me. She doesn't have any family of her own, but she's one of my family now. She keeps me right. She lives across from me. She came about the same time as me, so we've made good friends. 
We created this ourselves by having a cup of tea in each other's rooms, but that was very nice to meet somebody early on. Okay, over to you, Sherry. Sorry, forgot to put my mic on there for a minute. Hopefully you can hear me now. Yes, okay. we can. Brilliant. OK, thanks, Barbara. So, yeah, thinking about a person centred approach and obviously it's not one size fits all. Everyone has their own different personality type and their own individual, what we like to call recipe for connection. And some people prefer their own company. But even people who do prefer to spend most of their time alone may still want and need those opportunities to spend time with others when they choose to do so. For example, one man that we spoke to in a care home preferred to spend most of his time in his room. He didn't want to join in group activities. That wasn't his thing, but he loved it when someone came in to talk to him. Some people might also isolate themselves when that isn't necessarily what they ideally want. For instance, as a result of communication difficulties, if people have tried to connect and have been unsuccessful in the past, that can really deter them from trying again, as we've heard from some of those quotes from people that Barbara just mentioned. And evidence has shown that um, when people are treated as though they're incapable of social interaction because it's hard to communicate with them or for them to communicate with others, they will soon tend to withdraw and stop trying, which is likely to then become a bit of a vicious circle. So it's essential to not make assumptions about what people want, but to really find out what their wishes and preferences are for their social relationships and plan for how these can be supported. And also, of course, consider that these may not be the same all the time and can change because somebody doesn't normally want to go out on a bus trip or join an event, for instance, and says no every time that they're asked doesn't mean that they never will or that they might not enjoy it if they eventually do. And we'll talk a bit more later about the role of personal planning and how that supports personhood. OK, Barbara. Great. OK, so over to the next interactive bit. And we know that there's a wealth of experience in the room and we want to tap into your knowledge and your ideas as well and to give you a chance to share your good practice ideas or just things that, you know, automatically come kind of day to day that really make a difference. So what are some of the things you're already doing um, to support friendships? So using the AHA slides. And Louise will pick out some of these. Ooh, so there's lots of really, really interesting ways here and um, there's something about when, when somebody moves into the home maybe a buddy system or introducing a new resident to like-minded people um and gosh i really I, I i would really value that because you know when you when you move to a new place or a new there's nothing like somebody coming and saying i'll show you about or i'll help you get to know the the place um you know when you're feeling particularly nervous and vulnerable so that absolutely lovely and then there's there's um there's different areas of interest that you you were mentioning earlier. Um, you know those common interests, Barbara, shared interests. So there's things like gardening, uh, um, a men's club, common interest, uh, and 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 then there's wider group activities such as meal times or sitting people together at the table. So um, yes, you know, uh, you know. Uh, if you're, um, I'm, I'm just thinking of myself, how nice it is to, for somebody to say, oh, would you like to come over here and join somebody that I don't know? Because I might feel nervous about doing that. So having somebody to help me in with that. And that's what Sherry was saying about that recipe for connection. Oh, and there's another lo lovely baking groups. Because again, if you're if you're into baking, um, having that connection, that shared interest. And then residents going out for coffee with their friends from the home. So when you spend time with somebody doing something like going for coffee or being in a baking group, that helps build up those connections. Um, and there's a lovely one about that 
that that whole value system about treating people as adults and being truly person centred, as you and I would like to be treated as adults, and indeed as we're going to be treated mm. um, as we if we have that pleasure of ageing and we may well end up um, being supported to live at home or in a in a care home, and. Then there's that nice connection, and we've been talking internally, but there's a nice connection about joining in the community. Perhaps that's a wider community, um, because of course there are so many hobbies out and about in the in the area um, as well. Um, and somebody in the chat's talking about using person-centered tools to really get mm. to know the person, supporting that depth of knowledge. So yeah. there's so many different things here, and I can see there are three pages of different, yeah, brilliant. different <laughs> involvement, Sherry. Yeah, thank you, everybody. OK, so we're going to move on to what services can do, and Sherry's going to move us into this next slide. That's great. Thanks, Barbara. And thank you, everybody. Some really brilliant ideas there. And I don't know what else we can tell you, to be honest, because you've said so many of the things that we're probably going to cover. But hopefully, you know, we might have a few new ideas as well. So, yeah, the next section of the webinar is just hopefully building on that and bringing up, um, you know, some ideas for things that services can do to help foster those positive peer relationships. So we've already touched on this and it's been mentioned um, by, you know, by some of you, but finding out about and recording people's social preferences and interests is obviously important. Talking to people and those who know them the best to find out about who they are, what do they like to do, what their interests are. Are they the sort of person that likes to spend time in groups, for instance, or do they prefer to engage with people one to one and making sure that information is accessible and available to everybody who needs to know it. Um, again, already mentioned, you can make a point of introducing people to each other who might have commonalities or shared interests, create opportunities for people to spend time together and get to know each other. So, for example, occupational background, places that people have worked in, places they've lived in, shared interests, personality types. Doesn't necessarily mean that people will get on, but it makes it more likely when people have things in common. So, for instance, I'm thinking about two residents in a care home who had both lived in the same foreign country in their younger days and loved nothing more than sitting together and sharing all their memories and reminiscences. Introducing people to their neighbours when they first move into the care home or when they start using the service and continuing to introduce people by name when people might have forgotten who others are or what their name is. Just saying like here's Betty or whatever every time can really make a big difference to people. Again, I um, already mentioned, consider buddying people up to help them settle in. Um, I spoke to two ladies recently who had met on one of their first day when the other one was asked to show her around and they formed a great friendship which was really important to both of them and I'm just thinking here about a lovely quote from a member of staff about how satisfying it was to see people making friends and the effect that had on people and what she said was it was great to see people form friendships because everybody needs somebody as well and they don't want to feel alone which I think sums it up nicely really. So again, we've touched on this already, but identifying and finding ways of addressing specific impairments that people have, which affect their ability to interact with each other is obviously really important. Small things like making sure that people have their hearing aids and the right glasses on, for instance, and that hearing aids are working properly and the glasses are clean can make a big difference. Even a mild hearing impairment has been shown to have a major impact on people's social functioning and quality of life. So again, it's important to think carefully about the sorts of barriers to communication that people might be experiencing so that they're enabled to have better experiences. And ensuring that people are enabled to spend time with their friends, even if their needs change, such as becoming less mobile or moving to a different part of the care home maybe. And if people do disappear because they're admitted to hospital or because they pass away, make sure that other people know what has happened and are supported as needed. And I know that sounds obvious, but we know from talking to people that it doesn't always happen. Okay, okay. Barbara, that's over to you. Yep, great. Thank you. 
And again, a lot of the great ideas and what people are already doing. So this is just building on the knowledge. Um, so engagement in group activities can be a good way for people to get to know each other and to build and maintain meaningful relationships. Some people felt a sense of achievement and significance when they were able to contribute to activities and help others, generating that sense of reciprocity, which supports people's sense of value and self-worth. Research found that participatory arts activities like music and drama were particularly effective in providing the opportunities for meaningful contact and building a sense of community. Participatory group activities can build and maintain positive relationships with peers, particularly when they're learning something new and have opportunities to support and encourage each other. One person said that it's made it more of a communal feeling. We feel like we're a little family. Creative art activities like music, singing, seated dance, group reminiscence activities can enhance interactions and relationships with peers, including some people with more advanced dementia. Some services have been able to involve external arts organisations to come in and run groups and deliver training for staff to help them run their own groups, which people have found very beneficial. One staff member said that it brings together residents who would not normally choose to do other activities and builds friendships in the home. People talked about laughter together and just having fun and how this benefited the relationships as well as being able to express their creativity. Small group activities may support some people more effectively than larger groups, as people have indicated, and being mindful of people's needs and preferences. Creating opportunities for conversations and a coffee morning following an activity rather than rushing people back to their rooms or back into the lounge. Looking at the timings for activities and having different things on at different times. Many services also only employ activity staff during the week and there can be little provision at weekends when staff are under additional pressures. Getting out and about on trips and into the community where possible can be a great way of helping people to get to know each other and foster friendships. For instance, a new resident in a care home was recently invited to go on a bus trip with a small group of other ladies who the activities coordinator thought she might get on well with, and this worked really well. So rather than just focusing on where you're going, but trying to look at who's going on the trip so that people can form relationships and you know, develop meaningful relationships together in a shared activity really helps. Events, parties and celebrations can also be a great way of sparking conversation between people and helping them to get to know others. Celebrating important, important events, not only for residents, but also for staff, such as weddings or baby showers, helps to build a sense of community. And it is also a good opportunity to involve families in this as having support from others can also encourage people to feel more comfortable and give them confidence to form friendships with their peers. Visits to the care home by um, nursery children or visiting pets can also be a great way of facilitating interaction and helping others to make connections. Over to you, Shani. Great, thanks Barbara. Yeah, so a few other things to consider. Ensuring that the indoor and outdoor environment is well planned with a range of options to encourage group and one-to-one -one socialising. For instance, thinking about where people have the opportunity to spend time, how the seating is arranged and so on. Is there a lot of background noise in certain areas and are there quieter areas where people can spend time together if they want to do that? Do people know about them and have the chance to use them? Sometimes care homes do have a choice of lovely areas where people can spend time during the day, but nobody actually uses them, which could be through choice or just because people have, don't know or have forgotten that they're there. Opportunities for small group living can often enhance people's experiences and give them the chance to get to know each other better. 
On the other hand, having the opportunity to mix with people from other parts of the home or from different services can broaden people's social networks. Some care homes have good links with nearby sheltered housing services, for instance, and people have the chance to meet and spend time with others who they don't see all the time, either as a regular thing or for particular events. Some services run events like a regular community cafe where people in the local community can come in, have a cup of tea and a cake. So considering not only where people spend their time during the day, but who they sit near to in communal areas, such as in the lounge, particularly if they're not independently mobile, being really intentional about where people have that opportunity to spend their time and who they sit beside can have a really big impact on somebody's experience. As we heard from some of those quotes earlier, like there was nobody to talk to, it was too noisy, I didn't know anybody and so on. People can easily decide to isolate themselves in their rooms if they've had a negative experience. As one activities organiser said, it's like a jigsaw for me because I think, who can I put together? Who would like to sit together? Hmm. Thinking about mealtimes as a social occasion and not just for nutrition, they're a major social part of the day for lots of us and they're a natural point for interaction. So it can be a, a really good opportunity for building relationships and a sense of community. And as we mentioned earlier, there's a, a lot of research to show that increased social engagement is linked with overall better nutritional intake. So there are multiple benefits there. There are lots of things that can help support increased interaction at mealtimes. Um, things like making sure that people have choices of where to sit and who with, or if they're not able to decide this themselves. Again, thinking about who they sit beside can help people to make connections. Things like having menus on the tables or different mealtime themes can be a good trigger for conversation between people. And involving people who want to and are able to do things to help prepare or serve food or lay the table in whatever ways they're able to manage also encourages interaction and can really support people's personhood and their sense of value and self-worth not everybody is going to be able to do that or want to do that but you know maybe there are some people who can and again thinking about and trying to minimize any barriers associated with sensory impairments can make a massive difference to people's experiences if staff can sit at the table and be involved to support conversations, that's also really helpful. And still on the subject of eating and drinking, some services have designated an area as a cafe or a pub where people can get together informally or for particular events like watching a rugby or a football match or in other events, which can be a great boost to social interaction. Right, so thinking about some of the barriers that might exist, um, there are obviously various potential barriers and we've already touched on a lot of this earlier. We've talked about sensory, cognitive or functional impairments and how these can severely affect people's ability to connect or can potentially put them off trying. Another possible factor is an organisational culture which doesn't attach much importance to people's needs for meaningful connection. So when people's physical needs and staff routines are prioritised and social needs aren't valued in the same way, and it's very easy to fall into that very sort of task focused approach when staff are busy, but being aware of and looking out for opportunities to connect people doesn't always necessarily have to take additional time. And also just to let people know, while we're talking about creating that kind of culture for connection, um, we've developed a self-evaluation tool, which services will be able to use to evaluate areas relevant to supporting meaningful connection. And we'll be rolling that out to services in the near future. So just a little plug for that there. We've already talked about the impact of the physical environments and on the last slide and how things like layout and noise levels can help or hinder people to connect. Um, using an environmental assessment tool like the King's Fund tool, for instance, which many people will be familiar with, can be helpful in thinking about that. And another 
important factor that we can't ignore could be staffing allocation that is not supportive in creating opportunities for meaningful connection. For instance, some people with multiple health needs will just need more time to get places. And of course, the ability to plan activities and get out and about can be seriously impacted by a lack of available staff. So consider trying to use other people creatively wherever possible, such as encouraging the involvement of volunteers and families who might be able to help support with this. Another possible factor is a lack of person-centred care planning, which means that staff might not have the information that they need to be able to best support people with connection. And we'll come on to talk a bit more about that in the next slide. And over there at the side, sorry, just moved. Can you can you move back, Barbara? So, thanks. Over there at the side, we've got changing guidance and outbreak managements. Um, so just to recognise that there can also be specific challenges in terms of keeping on top of guidance and supporting people during any times of outbreak. And that's it. Over to you, Barbara. OK, thank you. So let's look at personal planning in a bit more detail. So we gather all this information about people. We have assessments, we have social information, we have life story work, we have choices, wishes and preferences. But how can we bring this all together for people to support relationships so that they are not meaningless documents that gather dust or sit in an electronic file doing nothing? And often these files just sit in isolation. You know, people are not seeing the whole view of people that are living, maybe in small group living or in a, a unit or even in the whole home. So these things are time consuming. We all know the amount of work and time that goes into updating all these documents. So any paperwork needs to have a point and bring meaning to support positive outcomes for people. There's no point gathering all that information and wasting time if you're not going to use it effectively. So meaningful, person-centred, personal planning is a thread that runs through everything in all care settings. In relation to meaningful connection, good personal planning is all about valuing the importance of connection and finding out what people's wishes and needs are in relation to this and planning for how this can be best supported in day-to-day -day practice to achieve people's personal outcomes and helping make sure that they get the best out of life. So finding out and recording key information relevant to meaningful connection is really important. In relation to peer relationships, this could include like what people's preferences are for communication, what interests or life experiences they have and that how that might help them connect with others. Who are the people they do and don't want to spend time with? What are any barriers they experience and how can this be addressed? If people have connections that they value, how can we make sure this is sustained, even if there's a change in circumstance or a change in staffing um, or people working with them who may not know them as well as others? For instance, if somebody becomes less mobile, how might this affect their ability to maintain friendships? Research has shown that people who aren't as able to mobilise um, as independently are overall and um, they've got fewer friendships with people. A personal plan is not just a detailed record of important information, but it should also support staff to provide a consistent support respecting people's choices and wishes. So for me, it's not just about the what, but it's about the how, and this can so often be missing. So, for example, using uh, an iPad, uh, maybe to speak to a close friend, uh, maybe who's in another part of the, the home, they might need a real consistent approach in how to use that if they've got um, some cognitive impairment. So ideally, it should be written in a way that any staff member should be able to pick it up and provide that support. It's also important to consider the potential impact for grief and loss and how to support someone who is grieving the loss of a friend. Some people reported that friends they had um, a connection with, they simply disappeared, which we mentioned earlier. And when they have been admitted to hospital or had passed away, nobody had told them what had happened and they were left to miss that person without explanation. 
even people with more advanced cognitive impairment can experience grief and loss when a relationship that they're used to seeing and experiencing every day is not there. People told us they stopped going to the dining room for meals and also participating in events because they did not want to lose any more friends. So maybe looking at and exploring this with people and what support could be offered so that they're not then isolating themselves um, with the great impact that social isolation and loneliness can have on people's health and well-being. Maybe there's a need to explore that in more detail. We also need to consider that circumstances can change and people's wishes and preferences may also change. Because somebody doesn't want to do something one day, uh, they might not want to do it the next. So gathering this type of information on a continuing basis during reviews or discussions can make sure that it's put into practice effectively. It can make people and keep connections that really enrich everyday lives respect and promote their personhood and make a big contribution to their overall health and well-being. And I think sometimes with personal planning, you have to think creatively. We were in one care home recently during our 20 visits um, to the, the homes to gather people's views. And one of the care home managers discussed about putting a big piece of paper up in a room um, in the, the staff area and all the staff, including maintenance, they can find out really, you know, they're in and have different relationships with people, um, housekeeping staff, the, the cooks, everybody involved in the home. They were able to start putting up relevant bits of information, random facts about people, um, all into a big mind map for each different person that was living in the home. And then they looked at that, they spread it all out into the lounge together, and then you could immediately see different people's connections. Oh, I didn't realise they liked cats, or they did, or they used to go to Barbados on a cruise, so did they. Lots of different things, or even cutting out small cards and um, with um, the person's name and maybe a hobby or interest and trying to match that up and you can use that as a kind of team building um, you know a event for, for staff as well involving families as well in discussions. I was also at a uh, um, one of the care homes and we had a focus group with family members and just by bringing people together informally, finding out that wealth of information about people. And I found out that, you know, three people in particular had isolated themselves at mealtimes. And it was because of the people that they had maybe been placed beside or to do with sensory impairments. So there's lots of small things that we can do that can make a big difference. We also have a personal planning guide, which is available on the, the Care Inspectorate website or we'd be happy to support anyone if they've got any specific questions you can email our Anne's Law website um, not website email address so let's move on to the next interactive part and We've obviously shared a lot of information. You've given loads of good ideas as well. You might have seen something that someone's popped up in the screen. So what are some of the things, you know, it can just be even something very simple. What might you try back at work? Um, you know, let's make a kind of pledge or a commitment to try something new or to maybe something you used to do before the pandemic that you've maybe not been doing um, or starting to um, reintroduce things. So what are some of the things that you might try back at work? And I think, Louise, you're going to come back in here and um, highlight some of these um, contributions. So thank you, everybody. Just giving people a time to yep, definitely. catch up there. Lots coming in. Mm. What's really nice here are the, those considered answers where people have really <clears throat> thought through and listened and, and found something that they connect with that they can try back where they work. <clears throat> There's quite a few people thinking about this buddy system mm. and also buddies, you know, buddy system for new for new residents. Obviously, we've been talking about earlier 
um, and also maybe a buddy system for existing folk. Um, you know, maybe somebody who's out in the garden a lot to buddy up with somebody to say, let, let, let me show you around the garden. Let me, you know, let me show you what's been happening because things, things are new and different. Um, community connections, making those connections out with around those those recipes for connections, linking with other services, other other places and community interest groups. And oftentimes we, you know, we don't know all of the many, many third sector and interest groups that are out and about where folk are only delighted to connect with that common interest. So that's a, that's a fabulous idea. Newsletters, a couple of folk have talked about newsletters and also family encouragement. Mm. Um, so really getting to know the person e e even better because you know you know folk well, but trying to get to know folk even better. Um, and then that, that recipe connection, different ways. And I think there was a mind map there as well. Um, mind mapping. Yeah, and if you haven't come across mind mapping, because it sounds quite grandiose, but it's literally just, you know, putting something in the middle of the paper. So it could be Louise and a little arrow to say Louise likes being outdoors and she likes flowers and she likes, you know, um, I'm learning to play the fiddle, believe it or not. So, you know, there are different things that I'm interested in. So it's, it's um, you'll you'll find mind maps on online. And making meal times more than just a meal. Somebody's mm. going to try different menus, setting the table, and really, you know, finding finding a way to make it that somebody will really be interested in coming along and sitting down and introducing. Um, so there's so many different places, things that people are thinking about um, starting. Men's club has featured as well a couple of times, and also a ladies' group, a soup making club, social evenings. Fabulous ideas, and people are still typing, Barbara. But yes, it's brilliant. Yeah, thank you. And I think you know, as we've said, you know, we've moved through the um, the pandemic. We're still facing, you know, staffing issues. The sector is really, you know, under a lot of pressure. So a lot of the information that we've shared is not new. But I think because we've all experienced, you know, so much trauma and strain and, you know, just such a different way of working, sometimes a lot of our memories and things that we used to do are kind of somewhere back and lost in our great ma grey matter. And we just need these type of sessions just to really inspire. Oh, yeah, we used to do that or that. You, we did that 10 years ago. We've not done that or trying the different things. And I think the buddy thing as well is a really good idea idea particularly you know with people with dementia your dementia you know it, um the journey is very individual and people progress at different rates so it might be that you can you know someone might have bud buddied up someone at one point and um, but then there might be other people that they can then support and um, so lots of really really good ideas and we're very grateful for everyone who's attended and for contributing. So thank you so much for being part of today's webinar. Please do keep in touch with us. We've got a dedicated space now on the Care Inspectorate website. The COVID tab has been removed and we've got a dedicated space for visiting Meaningful Connection and Anne's Law. So please do keep checking in there and signpost um, residents and families to that. There's a section there for them too. And do, if you want to delve deeper into the literature review and um, that's on there too and there's new content going to be coming out all the time on the website we've also got a podcast series with lots of guests we've got louise as one of the guests and um, we're talking about the importance of getting outdoors We've also got a guidance document that's being produced and we're going to be running a webinar um, the last Wednesday of every month. So we've got the next webinar, which is in June. The 28th of June is about family carers being partners in care. And then we've got one on um, the health and social care standards, not just the two, but using how we can really evidence the health and social care standards in connection and evidencing all the good work that you do um, and looking how we can um, really capture a lot of that. So thank you everybody so much. We have got a few minutes left. Um, I don't know if Sherry and um, Louise, if there's any questions in the chat that um, you might want to highlight. 
Um, but we'll give it a couple of minutes and if there's any questions coming in, I don't know if um, Sherry, you've got any closing remarks. I've just put the um, evaluation form link and also the sign up link for our next webinar in the chat. So if people are able to give us some feedback, that would be great. You know, it's all it's all really beneficial. Um, and if anyone's interested in signing up for that next webinar that Barbara has just told you about, um, which is about family inclusion, then please do so. And we'll be running that on, I think it's the 28th of June yep. at the same time, 2 p.m hopefully yeah. without the technical hitches that we had yeah. today yeah and it would Thanks. be really helpful if you could fill in the evaluation form because obviously that helps us to develop the content if you're happy with the design of the styles if the interactive section worked if we could do anything better and um, please do um do pop that into your evaluation and we also have a mailing list many of you will be here because of that but if people haven't signed up to the mailing list then please do that louise any closing remarks from you or any questions that are in the chat well just as usual people have so many skills and qualities and ideas mm -hmm. that they're already bringing to work and it's so great to have this ability to share across and a couple of things people have mentioned um and somebody has oh leslie's very handily put in the link for the helen sanderson website it's in the chat because there's fantastic ways to find out about uh, you know, person-centred planning tools and reference to lots of other, uh, Claire talking about the work of John O'Brien, Connie Lyle O'Brien and um, so on. Um, again, connected to um, Helen Sanderson would be a really great place to look and folk being really committed to, to making change. That's lovely to see. Yep. OK, well, thank you, everybody, so much for joining. And I'm not sure what the weather's like with you, but here where I am, it's absolutely glorious. So I hope you can get out and get a bit of sun in your face. And hopefully this is not our summer. So from myself, um, thank you so much. And um, from all of us, well, myself and Sherry, and thank you so much, Louise, for joining us today. We much appreciate your support. So thank you, everybody. Everybody and the recording will be available on the website. We will share a link to that. Um, so please um, share it with colleagues, with carers, anyone who you might think would benefit from just having that refresher about ways, practical ways that we can support peer relationships and really help people to live good lives in care homes with meaningful connections. So thank you so much. Yeah, and thanks, everyone. That's we'll us. see you at the next one. Yep. Cheers. <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye now. I'll just stop the recording before we do any more. Put up the link for the next one again. Everything did we do? A bit... Yeah, did we do a link? I think yeah. some people are still on. Yeah, I we can't... did. I'm just putting it up again. Stop recording.